Hi, so um, my name is Patty, and I manage the public programs here in Visitor Services at California Historical Society. And I'm really excited to have you here for our first panel discussion um, in celebration of our exhibition, which is eight mural stories from Los Angeles of uh, murals that were whitewashed, which was painted over, censored, destroyed. Um, and so this discussion will talk about um, a lot of things and is probably the first of many that we'll plan and we'll work on together. And we're really happy to have you here tonight to um, discuss this very important topic and to continue the conversation afterwards. So I have a couple of tasks before I do the bios. Um, one, you know, do more research after you're here and learn more about this topic after you leave. Um, talk to Carlos and Josue and Martivan and Maurizio about what they do and expand the knowledge that you're gonna learn tonight because there's so much more that um, can be learned about this topic that, that branches art, culture, history, so many different components of the, the story that is um, multivalent. So that's my first task. And my second one is um, as they're talking about particular things, go to those places, um, participate in those places and, and help um, keep those places alive. Um, if they continue on or go there and remember them. So um, those are a couple of things that I, I task you all with tonight and, and then ask really good questions during the Q&A. So that's three, um, not just two, but, um, and, uh, and keep those questions um, until the very end of all the presentations. So um, for uh, my, one of my best uh, moments usually during introductions is to introduce our fabulous uh, set of speakers tonight. And I'll start with Mardivan Galindo, who is our second seated here. Uh, Mardivan was born in San Salvador, El Salvador, in Central America. She has a PhD in Hispanic Languages and Literature from UC Berkeley um, from, in 1998 and um, is also an architect. University of Salvador, Central America, Emeritus Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at Holy Names University, just recently retired. She's also a writer, a painter, and a printmaker, and was one of the founding members and directors of the Cultural Center of El Salvador, Codices, um, from 1985 to 1991. So we thank her for participating tonight and um, um, bringing so much of her experiences here to um, CHS. So thank you. Um, I'm here to also introduce uh, Dr. Cordova, who's here um, on my very direct right. Um, he's a native of El Salvador, has lived in San Francisco since 1965, and has actively participated in Latino communities for five decades. He's a professor of Latino studies in the College of Ethnic Studies at SF State, and has been for over 43 years, wow. Um, and is teaching courses in behavioral and social sciences, community organizing, and Latino arts. Um, uh, he's a lead researcher, team leader, founding member of the San Francisco Latino Historical Society. I was just looking up their website, liking them on Facebook, learning more about them. Um, responsible for the research and the writing of San Francisco's Latino context statement, Nuestra Historia, documenting the Chicano, Latina, Latino, and Indije uh, contributions um, to the development of San Francisco, which is a project funded to the San Francisco Latino Historical Society and uh, San Francisco Heritage. We also have the Great Calle 24 booklets as well in our partner area, so please take those and learn more about Calle 24 um, as well. Um, where am I right now? Um, so that's a little bit about Carlos, and we really thank him for being here. I mean, he's written books, he's done so many things. I could go much further than I have. But like I said, after the program and the presenting is done, the Q&A, please go and, and ask him questions and, and learn more about him. Um, he has research specialties in Latino cultural studies, extensive work conducted by Latino Arts in the United States, founding member of Mission Cultural Center in San Francisco. I mean, really, he's a giant. So we thank you for being here. Um, and now we're on to Josue Warhas, who's um, the third from my right, executive director of Axion Latina, um, which he began uh, being the director in 2017. He's an artist, educator, and mission native. Uh, Rojas has over 20 years experience in the fine arts, community arts, arts leadership, and bilingual and ethnic media in the San Francisco Bay Area. Throughout his many endeavors, his work and his vision has been characterized by a commitment to San Francisco's cherished values of community arts and media, civic engagement, social justice, and empowerment for migrant communities and marginalized communities at large. Um, so we welcome him as well. Um, so he'll be speaking tonight. Um, Maurizio Ramirez is a third year PhD student in Latino studies and Latin American studies with an emphasis in visual studies at UC Santa Cruz. Before this program, Maurizio received a master's in arts in the visual um, Minister of Arts and teaching visual arts at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and a bachelor degree in art at UC Santa Cruz. He's also um, is a part-time teacher for the Imagine Bus Project, which is an amazing project um, where he teaches visual arts to incarcerated youth in San Mateo and San Francisco counties. 
Um, his interests lay in the field of Latin uh, visual arts with a focus on public art and murals in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Um, so I'm really happy to have all four of our speakers tonight. I really thank them for presenting and sharing their histories and these stories tonight. And as I said, the questions will be at the end. We'll use one of these mics and rove it around. So um, when you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll come find you. And Carlos will start with his presentation and then we'll just go down the line until the Q&A. So we thank everybody for being here. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here and give you a brief 15 minutes uh, of 150 years of history. Uh, it's a very difficult task to do. I usually teach an entire semester um, class you know, on Central Americans in the US, uh, which was the first course on Central American studies to ever be taught in the United States. I began to teach that course in 1974 at San Francisco State University. Um, one of the things that um, motivated me to study the history of Central Americans in this country was the fact that as I was a student, an undergraduate student and a high school student, um, we would be told that the Central Americans had no history in this country, that we were recent immigrants and therefore we had no importance in our history in this country. But reality was different. Uh, as I began to do research, as I began to look at migrations, and I began to look at uh, uh, the shipping records, began to see that many Central Americans were arriving in San Francisco at the time of the gold rush. Um, we hear about the Chileans, the Peruvians, but the boats also stopped in Panama and El Salvador, in Mexico, uh, and eventually reached San Francisco, who was the that was the destination point. So we find that during the early migrations, there were a significant number of Central Americans living in uh, San Francisco. The numbers, of course, were not big, and it cannot be considered, let's say, a migration wave, because in order to be a migration wave, you need to have a significant number, a large number of people who migrate for similar causes, for similar reasons. And so what ended up happening is that by 1870, the numbers begin to rise. And that's because also at the same time in Central America, there is a new crop introduced to the local economies, the local agricultural economies, and that is coffee. And in the United States, San Francisco was the main place where the coffee companies were located. And San Francisco was basically the port of shipping uh, of many of these uh, goods that were coming in, not only from El Salvador, Guatemala, but also from Nicaragua, because it was also um, a place here where we would find a number of uh, businesses that were owned by United Fruit Company. Um, San Francisco actually had their, its own, what was called the, the banana uh, terminal, where the banana boats would come from Nicaragua and Guatemala and would come on the Pacific side. Um, on the Atlantic side, they would go to New Orleans, they would go to other places, uh, to Boston, but mostly in San Francisco was different. These coffee companies were, again, mostly MJB, Hills, and Folgers that were located here in the South of Market area, um, where now you see all these new condos that have been built, uh, and uh, that's where they were actually found. Um, we find that uh, Hills Brothers, for example, um, the, their main headquarters and their plant was located at 2 Harrison Street, right at the base of uh, the Bay Bridge. This was, again, uh, part of Rincon Hill, uh, part of... Uh, um, a community uh, that uh, people actually that work at many of these companies were actually be residing at. It was common during this time, for example, for workers to live close by to the places of employment. Um, reality is that the public transportation was not really reliable, and people would walk from their homes, from the places where they live, to their places of employment on a daily basis. Uh, and therefore, this community was really important in the area of uh, Rincon Hill. Um, I put a lot of uh, 
information here so you can see it. But during these early times, um, also people lived in what was called the Latin Quarter or Little Mexico, which was located in North Beach. Uh, North Beach was the main hub for the Mexican community. It was the place uh, of tremendous activity, commercial, cultural, social activity of Latinos who lived in San Francisco, um, mostly around Chinatown, um, especially Broadway, uh, all the way to uh, the areas on top of the Broadway Tunnel. Uh, this was all the place where uh, many Latinos actually live and dedicated themselves actually worshipped uh, at the Lady of Guadalupe Church, which was the main place of attraction. Why did people go to that area? Why did they locate themselves uh, in the, let's say, uh, 1860s, 1870s? Well, the reality was that the church was built in it was the only church in San Francisco that had a Spanish-speaking priest. And that attracted many Mexicans, many Central Americans who lived in that area. Of course, during this time, the majority of residents in this uh, neighborhood uh, was actually uh, of Mexican descent, uh, but also there were many Central Americans, there were Basques who lived there, uh, and this became a place of great activity. We have that the second migration wave, but I have a catalog that's a second migration wave, uh, actually happened during the 1930s. This was a time of political changes in Central America. The rise of military dictatorships when the United States imposed the military as a dominant force, but also to um, safeguard the U.S. interests in the region, coffee, bananas, uh, United Food Company, the coffee companies had a big hand in deciding who was going to be president in Nicaragua, who was going to be president in El Salvador and in Guatemala. And this was a time in which we see this happening. Um, in Nicaragua, the dictator Anastasio Somoza Garcia assumes power and rules the country with an iron hand. But the fact is that you know, scholars will say and uh, political uh, records will say, well, they were very much dictatorial governments, but not as bad as some of the ones that we see these days. Uh, the fact is, that, and I'm not apologizing for them, but the fact is that if somebody was an activist, they would basically send them on exile. Tell them, okay, you know, you get five days to leave and you gather whatever you can carry in your hands and that's how you go. Uh, and many Nicaraguans actually came to San Francisco and they became the largest Central American group. They are the ones that begin to set the foundations of the Central American communities that later were booming in the 60s and the 70s and then in the 80s. Um, what we find during this time, for example, is that you have a very diverse group. You have people who come from the upper classes, you have people that come from the middle class, you have people that come from the working class of Nicaragua and El Salvador coming in. And, uh, Many of them lose everything that they had. Former members of the National Guard who disagree with Somoza in Nicaragua also arrive. You have also priests, uh, students, uh, intellectuals, poets, writers who come to San Francisco at the time and they create a hub of interaction within the Central American community that is very dynamic. Um, what I found to be very interesting during this time is that many of them are not able to go back to Nicaragua at all because they are exiles. And if you go back then, the dictatorship will put you in jail, you will be tortured, and most likely you could be killed. But as long as you stay abroad, you can have all your political activities and all your cultural activities as long as you don't return. Many Central Americans during the 1930s uh, come mostly to California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, but they also go to New York. Uh, they go to, um, during this time, interestingly, Nicaraguans, um, like New Orleans, 
uh, as a Puerto destination, uh, and also some Guatemalans would go there because of the fact that this would be the main ports of entry into the United States. We know that for Europeans, Ellis Island becomes the port of entry, but for Central Americans and Latin Americans, it was New Orleans. That was the main port of entry when they came by boat, and San Francisco or Los Angeles when they came via the Pacific Coast. Uh, and this was something that was very important during this time, and that's why we became uh, the communities uh, that people favored to come to arrive. So again, you know, and I talked about this a little bit, Where did they work during this time, during the 30s and the 40s and the 50s? Uh, Central Americans worked in the factories. The men worked in factories. Uh, they worked in the slaughterhouses. They worked um, in the tanneries. I remember, for example, in the 1960s, late 60s, uh, living in the Mission District, and about 11 o'clock in the morning, we would get this really strong smell, this stench that would turn my stomach when I was in school. Uh, and it was so bad, and we couldn't figure out what it was, and it was the smell coming from the tanneries that the wind would bring that, I, that smell that was just very, very strong and powerful. Um, the women actually worked in the textile shops, uh, mostly in, in another, other factories. I met uh, women, for example, that worked uh, at Levi Strauss, at Corre, Lilian, um, and also others that worked... Uh, at a very large doll factory where the dolls would be made by hand, and it's located also on Broadway. Uh, others, you know, worked at smaller shops. But I remember a common joke that would take place in San Francisco when I came here, you know, and it was the fact that Levi Strauss was located on Valencia Street, popularly was called the University of Nicaragua. Why? Because when women came to San Francisco, they would write home send a letter and say, oh, I'm going to the university. Um, we tend to do that many times. You know, I remember myself when I first came to San Francisco with my sister. We went uh, near uh, Ocean Avenue to uh, uh, St. Francis Woods, and we stood in front of the house. We took some pictures. We sent it home. We didn't say we lived there, but people assumed that we actually lived in those nice homes while we lived in a flat on Albion Street and 16, by 16th Street that had no hot water uh, that had rats and uh, cockroaches uh, and things like this, but we tended to do that. Um, and um, the majority of people who lived in San Francisco who were Central Americans were Nicaraguans. Um, when I came in 1965, it was estimated that there were 60,000 Nicaraguans living in San Francisco at the time. Of course, the census wouldn't say that um, because many people at the time you know, would call themselves Spanish, they might call themselves other names, give themselves other identities as a way to pass. Uh, and one thing that happens that we were talking earlier um, with Anne Cervantes here, who's one of the record keepers of our history in the Mission District, was that many Latinos, uh, when we came here, we actually intermarried with other Latino groups. Chileans married Central Americans. There were a lot of Chileans here. There were Peruvians. There were also uh, uh, Nicaraguans and Salvadorians intermarrying each other. So all of a sudden, you know, we have Salvanicas, um, you know, and you, you talk to the kids. My children are Salvanicas, for example, uh, and always consider themselves to be mixed. Uh, and that was one of the things that happened. And this is where some of the... Uh, Factories were located. Also, the breweries uh, was a place where a lot of Central American and Mexican men actually worked. Uh, and those we find also in the South of Market area. Uh, many of these buildings are still there, um, except that they no longer are breweries. Now they're, again, uh, condo, uh, condos have been built, and they're very expensive. The third migration wave uh, came during World War II. There was a great demand for labor, and many Central Americans went to work in the Panama Canal, 
and it was there that they would work for a U.S. company, and then they were able to get a labor contract and came to San Francisco. Uh, or they would go to New York, which was the other place that many Central Americans went. Um, this was a great opportunity for many people. My father actually went during World War II to Panama, and about a week after he was there, the war ended. And so all of the jobs basically went down, and uh, he ended up staying for a year. And by then, it was too late. He wanted to come to San Francisco and bring the family, uh, but he wasn't able to do that at the time. Uh, but this was, again, a very common thing that would happen, and this was an interesting migration wave that we see during that time. Central Americans uh, began to work also creating uh, a number of uh, social migration networks, support systems, helping each other, um, what we call mutual aid societies, uh, you know, like uh, civic, civic groups. Uh, and this was something that uh, was many times associated with some of the local churches. Uh, Nicaraguans had a very strong um, a community uh, in the area around Castro Street uh, in the Castro District was all Central American at the time. Uh, at the Most Holy Redeemer Church uh, was a place where they would gather and where they would have most of their services and their organizations come out of. One of the things that happens uh, also uh, in this time is that uh, there's a lot of changes that take place after World War II. Uh, when the servicemen return from the war, they realize that San Francisco is going through changes. The Mission District, for example, where many Irish uh, and other European groups had lived, um, becomes pretty much available because they had what we call a voluntary type of migration out of the mission. They were not displaced. They voluntarily decided to relocate, and they went to buy homes that were found in the Sunset and the Richmond District. I was talking to um, one of my friends whose father actually moved to that area during that time, and he says that a home would cost about $5,000, uh, and it was very easy to purchase a home to get a loan, and they would move to those areas where they have brand new homes uh, and preferred to go there and left the mission alone. Some of the businesses remain, but the homes were actually found in that area of the city. Um, this was also a time in which many Central Americans began to change dramatically. Their whole strategy, um, many of them didn't find any more uh, the availability of jobs that they had found before because of the influx not only of the returning uh, servicemen, but also the fact that there was another internal migration within the United States, and it was the African-American migration. People who had gone to military service actually came to California, and San Francisco became a place that attracted many African-Americans. And so many Central Americans decided, well, you know, this is no longer the place to be, and they decided to return to Central America where they became part of a new social class in Central America. They became part of a new entrepreneurial class that had worked here and had done a lot of work um, using the models of employment that were found here and recreated those models back in Central America. All of a sudden we had uh, you know, a, a whole uh, type of uh, driving uh, restaurants uh, just like we see them in uh, San Francisco, like Mel's Driving, for example. Uh, there, was, there were avenues in which this type of restaurants would happen. Uh, some of them were in Central America done by Cuban uh, refugees and immigrants. Others were done by different uh, Central Americans who, who had returned. Um, in Nicaragua, for example, I met a family that had worked here in San Francisco making uh, caskets during the war. Um, it's good business to make cas caskets during the war. They returned to Nicaragua, and what did they do? They were carpenters. They were really good carpenters, and instead of doing furniture, they decided to start building caskets and to create a type of business which was like um, an insurance, a type of uh, death insurance, in which when you died, you paid monthly so much, and then when you 
died, you know, you would get all the services provided because you had already paid for them. And this was a, a family that eventually expanded their business throughout the entire region of Central America and the five countries of Central America. They control that specific business. And these were people who had lived in San Francisco, learned the trade here, and returned there. And that was just a, one example of so many that did that. But in the 60s, let me move it a little bit here. This is what I just talked about. Um, these, are, these were some of my classmates when I was studying in high school. Uh, and these were the kinds of things that we would do, uh, hanging out of, uh, in school. Uh, in 1965, we have another important migration uh, in the 1960s. And we see, again, the fact that many uh, Central Americans came because the new immigration law, the 1965 Act, uh, Immigration Act of 1965, allowed um, people from all over the world that had not been included as immigrants in the past to be given quotas. A certain number of individuals could come every year, approximately 2,000. And that's what I took the advantage of. I took the opportunity of coming in in 1965 using one of these quotas. Uh, in they promoted the idea of young people going to school and working in much desired areas in the United States. Um, I followed a migration network. I follow a family network. My sister had already arrived here three years earlier, and she brought me here. And eventually, I brought my parents, uh, and they live here for 30 years. Uh, and, you know, my children were born here, and so we have a long history now, well established in San Francisco. Again, you know, by 1965, approximately, uh, the United States Census would say that there were 57,000, uh, about 57,000 Central Americans living in the United States. But of course, that was not correct. There were probably 57,000 in San Francisco alone, and just Nicar from the Nicaraguan community. Uh, there were many more Salvadorans that had arrived. There were more Guatemalans who had arrived, and I didn't include here the Guatemalan migration of 1954 when many Guatemalans left because of political persecution. This is, uh, I know my time is almost done, uh, and uh, these are the migrations that we don't hear of. You know, we hear of people coming in undocumented. Uh, we hear our president calling them animals. Uh, we hear all these things that are taking place, you know, that are very discriminatory against Central Americans these days, but Central Americans have a long history of being established here, of being providing, in this case, a foundation for the Latino community that is very strong, very important, and with an incredible work ethic. We call ourselves uh, Central Americans, you know, basically the uh, hard laborers who are proud of our labor, of our work, and we instill that those ideas into our children. Um, there are many more migrations that happen there, many other factors from natural disasters to many other things uh, that we could talk to. But hopefully if anybody's interested, you know, I still teach the Central America course at, in, uh, uh, at San Francisco State. And Marco, you teach the Central America class at City? Okay, great. I'll give you a hand. I'll be very happy. Marco is a uh, also a professor at City College, and one of my best students. I'm always proud to say that, so it's great to see that. So I could keep on going with this for hours, but uh, again, you know, it's really a, a, a huge field to study, but, you know, and one of the things I want to continue again is dispelling the myths uh, that we are not an important part of our community, of our society, uh, in the life of this country. Thank you. Good evening, friends. I want to thank the California Historical Society for organizing this event and giving us the opportunity to speak about Central America and our experiences here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I just had an eye operation and that's why I'm wearing dark glasses. 
Trust me, you don't want to see me without them. The 80s were the years when a huge immigration of Salvadorians came to the San Francisco Bay Area. Terror, torture, persecution, repression, death squads, and the Civil War were causing all the Salvadorians to fly and leave our country. Some Salvadorians look south and went to the near Nicaragua or Costa Rica. Many more went north, came north to Mexico, and many more to the United States and Canada. In the United States, the favorite states were California and Washington. California with Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area. I came at the beginning of the 80s to live in Daly City because of my financial situation, and I came as a political exile. But at the end of the week, working in the peninsula, I longed so much to come to the mission, to eat, to see the Latino community, to talk in Spanish, and really visit the, the galleries and see what was going on in the Mission Cultural Center. In 1985, I had my first art exhibit at Macondo Cultural Center. This center was founded by Cristina Gutierrez, a social and political activist, and it was located in 22nd and Mission. From that exhibit, I got in touch with Salvadorans, and very soon they invite me to connect and to see what we could do for the culture of El Salvador and to spread the word about the culture of El Salvador here in San Francisco. We met for the first time at El Picaro Café in 16th Street and Mission. We were like 15 or 18 people. We were all excited about the idea of what we could do. And we started meeting in our own houses and apartments. Very soon, we organized our first event, a poetry reading at Macondo, the cultural center. And from the start, we had the support of our carnales, the Chicanos, in the Bay Area, who always supported us in all our events. In 1986, at the beginning, we were looking for a place where to establish our nest. We found a place at Balmy Alley. What else could we hope for? It was a dream. The place was used as a carpentry shop first. But by the time that we uh, went to see the place, it was an storage. The owner agreed and rented us the space. And that's how we got to have a place for our center. We were ecstatic that we were in Palmi Alley with a facade that had 
indigenous women from Guatemala, Maya women, as a mural. And next to us was a mural dedicated to the school of Roque Dalton, our national poet. At the other corner of Balmi in the 25th Street was Casa Nicaragua. When we started cleaning the place, we realized that we didn't have steps to go to the second floor. And there was no toilet either. So the first events that we invited people, we have to warn them, please be aware that you will have to use the taquerias or the pupuserias nearby because there is no toilet here. There was a sink though, but no toilet. Our Salvadoran community supported us and carpenters and plumbers came to our aid and people donated material and we were able to build a bathroom and the steps. I remember the first time that I came down those steps that were rustic ones. I felt like the queen of some enchanted place because before I was climbing a ladder to go to the offices that were in the second floor. No matter what, we have our place and we name it after another cultural center that was founded in Nicaragua by other Salvadorians, Codices, the name of the old Maya books, of pre-Columbian books. Since that is small and humble place that was cold in winter and very hot in summer, we did a lot of activity. The first thing was to create a shop for visual arts in which we included not only Salvadorian artists but also artists from other Latin American countries. We had two groups that represented codices. One was a musical group that was called Atonatl, directed by Pedro Rivera. And the other one was a folkloric dancing group directed by Ceci Obando, that is right here with us tonight. Thank you, Ceci. These two groups went around the Bay Area performing in every cultural center or any place where they were invited. We were not satisfied with doing our art and our music from our own artists living here in the Bay Area, but we also wanted to create bridges with Los Angeles, where there was another cultural group already working, and also with the artists in El Salvador, to give them the opportunity to share what they were doing there during terrible times during the war. And we brought writers such as Manlio Argueta, a very well-known novelist, who came in the 80s, and he did a series of workshops, readings, and writing workshops. We also have the visit of Carlo Mejia, an artist that was living in Washington, D.C., and who did some marvelous uh, Maya cars that uh, I will ask Pat to help me. I have two sets to be a, a raffle among all of you. Uh, and we had also uh, Isaías Mata, who came and organized an exhibit, an art exhibit in the Mission Cultural Center. These people were supported first by Carlos, who was a force in San Francisco State, helping us 
to promote our artists and writers that were coming and bringing them to San Francisco State because of Carlos was doing that connection. And we have also the amazing uh, support from individuals and organizations, such as uh, Ellen Gavin from Women in the Arts, and Foundation like San Francisco Foundation, California Art Council, Sellerback, Vanguard. These foundations, for example, supported a California Art Council, a project to teach children art after school, twice a week. And this was directed by another good friend, member of Codices, Ricardo Portillo. When Codices closed in 1991, the result, the last project, was Tamuanchan. Tamuanchan is a mythical place that some anthropologists believe is the cradle of the Maya civilization and is located in El Salvador. Some people say that we are dreaming, that that's not true, but it's a mythical place. And for us, have that quality, that symbolical meaning of going back to our paradise in some, somewhere, somewhere. So this group, Tamuanchan, was a project that the amazing artist, the Argentinian uh, Claudia Bernardi, created as a project that will teach printmaking to Salvadorian artists, and was the last project that she proposed to Codices. For five years, Amonchan existed with the funding of California Art Council and with Cala Institute being our space where we took the classes. When the money ended, after five years, we have a good time, Tamuan Shan continued as a second phase. In this second phase, some of the artists that were in the first one, very well known right now, like Victor Cartagena, Carlos Cartagena, Ricardo Partillo, myself, then we added another member that was Carmen Alegría, a combination, as Carlos was saying, Chilena, Salvadorian. Our first exhibit was at the Mission Cultural Center, but what we really dreamed was to go back to El Salvador and have an exhibition over there. And we did that in 1998. So we went back to Tamuanchan, to this uh, dream land, to this mythical land. We went back there as an offering that we brought our fruits, our artistic fruits that we made while being in exile or as refugees in San Francisco. Tamuanchan ended in 2000, but the artists that were part of Tamuanchan and were part of Codices still are working in the community, still working by themselves or in other projects for this wonderful city of San Francisco. And we feel proud that we have contributed culturally with our art, with our expressions, our musical expressions, to the rich culture of San Francisco. Thank you so much. Firstly, if, the, if you're an educator, if you're an artist, if you consider yourself a cultural worker, I just see so many great people in the crowd. Would you just raise your hand? I see Eric Arguello here. I see Marta Ayala. Uh, there's artists. There's um, Found SF is here with Chris and Lisa Ruth, Leticia Hernandez. Um, keep your hands up. Artists, cultural workers, educators, don't be shy. Miss Allison Martinez. 
Um, these are the heroes and the sheroes. Uh, make sure that you guys have a conversation with them. This, these are the, this is the living history of San Francisco arts and culture. I am a visual artist and I'm also the executive director of Acción Latina. And I'm going to show you guys a little bit of my work and my influences. Very, very fortunate to um, very, very fortunate to be in this space right now. As I said, here we go. Okay. Um, I want to start with. Yeah, I'm going to start with uh, the Mission District, which is where uh, I was. I had the good fortune of being raised. I'm a child of the very late '70s, so I came to San Francisco in 1981, at the very end of 1981, and I couldn't have landed at a better place. Um, it's a place that's full of vibrant culture, as you know, a place with that is very sensual. There's sights and there's sounds and there's a lot of beauty. And I always say that um, people want to see the beauty but often don't want to acknowledge the makers of the beauty, right? People want the song and sometimes don't want to see the songbird. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted us to uh, look at the people next to you because those are the heroes. These are the people that are making the work. I always say that um, people expect art and murals to be like uh, the Christmas elves, right? This workshop where you see the gifts in the morning, but you don't see the, the makers of the gifts. So um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of acknowledge uh, the artists and the makers. Okay, I'll get right into this. Um, my real first encounter with art was through the Mission District. At the age of 15 years old, I was uh, very angry. I was very sad. I lost family members in one year. Uh, I lost my cousin and my father all in one year, and I needed a place to put this. And luckily, I came to a space called Presida Eyes Mural Art Center uh, right on 24th Street. And they said, actually, at that point, it was... Um, Oh, never scan. At that point, it was right on Presida Park. And they said, hey, kid, looks like you have a lot to say. Why don't you take this bucket and uh, do something on this wall, this bucket of paint and this brush, and do something on this wall? And I said, OK. And I never looked back. I, uh, it was the greatest gift that was given to me. Um, fast forward, um, I took art very, very seriously at that age. And fast forward a few years, and I was at the California College of Arts and Crafts. I'm very proud of the C at the end of that, before they switched back to California College of the Arts. Anyway, I met Professor Claudia Bernardi. And um, I'll never forget, I was living in the uh, Bayview Hunters Point, And I came home one day from college, and I had a Che Guevara poster. Uh, and I put it on my window. And my mom says, oh, hell no, you're not doing that. And then I says, well, why? So she had spent all her life as a pretty fervent evangelical and protected, protecting us. One of the reasons why she left El Salvador was that so her four sons would not participate in the war. So she didn't want us to be politicized. So you would imagine how political could I have been. Uh, and it was, um, it was spaces like Balmy Alley, which uh, Carlos Cordova and uh, Martivon, as you, see, as you know, helped found. You know, I think um, we're talking a lot about spaces and things like sanctuary, right, which is a very political uh, a political hot point right now, but also it has its, it has its creative expression. And Balmy Alley is, in my mind, the creative expression of sanctuary. All right, so back to the, uh, the idea of being politicized. Uh, I had the fortune, the good fortune of meeting Claudia Bernardi, which Martivon uh, mentioned. And I am very proud to say that I am a Bernardista. I am part of the fruit of the, uh, of the artists that were politicized by this very influential artists. And her work was really geared towards uh, El Mosote. She was one of the people who dug up the evidences of El Mosote. Does anybody know when I say El Mosote what I'm talking about? Yeah? I mean, we're all historians, but um, I'll just give a quick layup to the video that I'm about to play. El Mosote was the single largest human rights violation uh, of the Americas, where upwards of, I'm going to say just slightly under a thousand people, mostly women, women and children were killed by the Salvadoran government uh, using U.S. Uh, weaponry. So better than I could say, I'll let this project speak for itself. We're going to watch a quick four and a half minute video about El Mosote, and then I'll talk to you a little bit more about my work. I hope we have this audio here.
ellas quemaron a la gente, le pusieron fuego a la casa y se vinieron a matar a los niños. Los niños los mataron por la noche. Yo, yo escuchaba, pero no crean que es fácil escuchar que los niños, los hijos de uno estén muriendo y no pueden hacer nada. Pues. choice of either joining the combatants or you had the choice of fleeing because the army came in here and was pretty much killing anybody who looked indigenous so you could either fight back or you could leave those were your choices I am talking about a community that survived a war of 12 years este gente bastante humilde y se caracteriza por eso por ser una colonia de excombatientes. Cuando se llega ahí y se le pregunta a cualquier persona de los que viven ahí, le va a contar una experiencia de los que han tenido de la guerra. El arte juega un papel importante en esto, en mantener en los pueblos y en las sociedades o en las nuevas generaciones memoria, memoria histórica. In the year 2001, the mayor and the leaders of the community asked if we could create a school of art. <laughs> the school of art was not my vision. Emphatically, this was the vision of the community, and exactly because of that is so powerful. Printmaking classes drawing classes, jewelry classes, photography classes, video classes, everything that we artists can produce as an offering the community takes. El interés que hay incluso de personas que vienen de otros municipios es también grande, hacen un esfuerzo, un sacrificio para estar acá, ¿verdad? Porque quieren aprender y porque no hay en otros sitios un espacio donde podamos recoger estas expresiones. We have a community of people that believe dearly that art matters. El arte nos reúne a todos en, en una manera tan espontánea, tan bonita, una vivencia tan bonita, y donde todos nos sentimos que sí sabemos hacer muchas cosas y que podemos hacerlas. Cuando yo veo las obras que he podido, obras de arte que he podido realizar, me siento una persona con con dignidad. Y esto es importante superar la baja autoestima que la gente pobre a veces eh, tiene. ¿no? El arte me parece en todo este contexto sumamente importante porque es una manera de reconciliarnos con nosotros mismos y de reconciliarnos después del conflicto con la demás gente. Estamos tratando de expresar lo que sentimos o lo que pensamos de eso que pasó. Es a través del arte, es a través de una fotografía, es a través de una canción, es a través de una pintura que tú puedes educar a la nueva generación. En primer lugar, para que nunca jamás se vuelva a dar una guerra entre nosotros, en nuestro país. Que tenemos que hablar de esto para que no se vuelva a repetir. Tú no miras todo, hay algo más que no se ve, hay que buscarlo, hay que... Y, es, y ese es el papel del arte, buscar algo más de lo que nuestros ojos alcanzan a ver. Um, so I was very lucky, <coughs> very, very fortunate to participate in, in this open school and studio of Pekin with Claudia and, and other students. And I think one of the huge, the very big takeaways for me was the fact that, you know, in art school, they teach you, they're very preoccupied with teaching you the how, right? This is how you mix, you know, uh, blue and red and get purple. Uh, you know, this is how you solve the problems of making art. This is how you, you know, this is the art store. It's over there. Go buy your stuff there. But 
I was a little bit more preoccupied with my own history and uh, the how, uh, aside from the how, the why. And uh, studying with Claudia really gave me the why. I really knew that I wanted to communicate uh, these realities. I wanted to communicate my own history. I wanted to learn it and then, and in, in any way that I could, project it out. And um, I was very lucky that I was in really good company, right, in San Francisco. Uh, Carlos and, and, and Martivon and uh, the community had already set up such a great space for, for we as this, the next generation of the 80s and the 90s to create this work. Um, so I was thinking, who, how, how can I speak to my generation of Central Americans? And, and San Francisco is such a powerful place. I have here a photo of, of uh, Ben Boxiera, uh, an advocate for the Alex Nieto memorial, which I am a part of, uh, of the committee for. And I see uh, Nancy Pili Hernandez, who is a cultural worker and works very closely with artists and was responsible for this really amazing um, resist banner that was dropped during the inauguration day uh, when 45 uh, was, was, uh, was in inaugurated. And what they two, both of these, these people, these folks have in common, my, my, my friends, is that they went from a life of first doing, um, being involved in gangs in the mission, and then being educators, then being lawyers, then being activists. And I thought, like, this is such a great reality that we have here in the Bay Area. And unfortunately, in spaces like El Salvador, um, the culture was so conservative that they wouldn't give former gang members a chance. Some of the deportees that were coming from uh, is from San Francisco, coming from Los Angeles mostly, coming from these spaces when they arrived to a Salvador or often arrived to a death sentence. So I said, how can I, how can I affect this? <clears throat> how can I use maybe something, uh, a model that, that in a way has worked in San Francisco of, of changing gang culture and bringing about uh, creative culture uh, as an alternative, as a viable alternative? Um, and of course, we can go, I can go on for at length, I can go on for a whole semester if I wanted to about the legacy of the war and the, the, the effect on the youth, right, both with the absence of parents and the, 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 the need for gathering together and that created gangs, but I won't. Um, I can instead offer you a link to this really great video that I did uh, and a mural that I did with young people of Honduras which is really heavily infested with gangs. Uh, I only have short time, so I won't show you this video, but I can provide this. And essentially what we did was, I do have uh, several images. We created an image. I, um, I kind of, uh, I don't know, cajoled Estria Miyashiro, who's a, a very renowned muralist. Um, I, I asked him to come with me and, and to create a mural at the space of a different type of human rights violation, a different massacre that happened in Honduras. Um, where upwards of 25 people were killed in a bus. And the gang members were blamed for this. Um, and that caused this huge crackdown on, uh, let me see here, this huge crackdown, you know, um, uh, and the justification for violence against these young people. Really what, it, what had happened and what was going on in the 2000s and the late 90s in Central America was a wholesale giving up on a generation. And I wanted to comment on that as an artist. I wanted to speak about that generation, because it was my generation, right? I had the fortune of, of being able to migrate, but for uh, mis camaradas and, and, and uh, my countrymen and women of that age group, they were essentially being given up on. So I'm showing you here uh, the headlines that these young people made. Uh, we introduced uh, the idea of murals and they took it and ran with it. And I don't think that we really uh, did anything uh, out of this world, we just, I just kind of, help initiate what was given to me, which is the license to say, hey, you are an artist. You can call yourself an artist. It's okay to do that. And uh, a funny fact, I was at NALAC last year, the National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures, and they were saying that Latino culture is really unique in that 80% of Latinos would consider themselves an artist in one way or another, right? So whether they're giving you, whether an artist Behind, in the, behind the counter in the kitchen, whether they're an artist singing mariachis, whether they're an artist singing in the shower, whether they're you know, doing papel picado, we consider ourselves a creative culture. So you know, just to have that license to say, hey, let's paint these murals, it just really, um, they took off and they did, they've done uh, upwards of 30 murals in San Pedro Sula, this group, and they call themselves now Pinceles del Barrio, which is brushes of, of the neighborhood. And you can find them, um, 
You can find them online, particularly Facebook. So these are the first uh, pintileros. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my work as a practicing artist, murals, again, graffiti and hip hop are a big influence in me. Um, it was really funny, I was part of a show, well, it was, it was funny for two reasons. One, it was called Morning, Morning and Scars. Firstly, uh, I have to say, because, um, I mean, we come from a place of, of, of beauty and joy, and certainly there is some darkness in our history and some erasure of history, but, you know, to, to have a creative show called Morning and Scars, I was just like, come on. Like, um, anyway, it was funny for that reason. The other reason is, um, I forget. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, but the idea is, that I, I think that there's, I just want to dispel the myth of there being pure, uh, just uh, these this idea of when you think of a Salvadoran migrant or a Central American migrant, this, these huddled masses and it's cold and it's scary. And I mean, yes, these things are true, but it's also traveling can be a very beautiful thing. Um, learning and, and, and bearing witness can be a very beautiful thing. Okay, here we are at Balmy Alley, uh, which has been mentioned before. Uh, Balmy Alley was for me, a real reckoning. It's really when I saw myself as an artist. Um, here's the entrance of it. This is uh, Mart Martivona. Am I correct in saying that that is where the uh, uh, La, La Escuela Nicaragua was at? Casa Nicaragua. And now is uh, the Clinica Martin Baró. So aside from one of my big influences being Car Carlos Cordova uh, at SF State, uh, Felix Curi, uh, who runs the Clinica, is a really big, uh, influence and I think it's because of his service to the community. He runs a clinic that serves mostly undocumented people on Saturdays, and he um, he he puts together this amazing team of young students from SF State, from USF, and from City College, and they offer uh, service to undocumented people. But he also is a holistic. He has a very holistic approach to healing. And you see here the, the, the other, I called myself a, a, a Bernardista after Claudia Bernardi, but I'm also a Martin Baroista. I believe in liberation psychology, the idea of uh, freeing, freeing your mind and your ass will follow uh, was put into this really great academic language by uh, Martin Baro. And uh, there's another book there that's really influential that, that I didn't put on here, and it's called Toward Psychologies of, uh, of Liberation. And it's about communities taking healing into their own hand. Um, so I'm very influenced by not only, you know, uh, blue plus red is purple, but also the ideas of, of, of our culture. Uh, and in true spirit, um, in community arts, my mother is always with me uh, whenever I make a mural. Uh, she's always chiming in. Here's a little piece of my art I want to show you. Um, um, I am trying to use the, I, the languages, right? Um, I think I find that artists in California have to be bilingual, not only in Spanish and English, but to speak the different languages. So you see here hints of uh, the Japanese animation of Astro Boy. Uh, you see some hints of uh, uh, the Big Boy Burger in LA, uh, 1950s cartoons, and you see some, um, obviously some maras, right, and some transnational presence here. And I just really wanted to humanize, uh, again, it's another expression of wanting to humanize uh, the young people of my generation. I call this the joy of exile. Uh, uh, another big influence, uh, it's always a literature piece. For me, it's um, Enrique's journey. Uh, the young migrants who come on the tops of trains from Central America. We saw the caravan uh, last month, or this month actually, of thousands of people who came from Honduras. Uh, well, this book, Enrique's journey, is a really amazing uh, Pulitzer Prize winning account of this young, this young man, Enrique's journey. And so that inspired this, uh, this mural that's in Balmy Alley, actually. So I had the great fortune of, uh, maybe it was 2008, 2010, I saw a blank wall and I said, hey, you gotta give me that wall. And they did, and uh, I worked on it. It took me a couple years to finish this, but this is my expression of, of, uh, of love for the migrants of the mission and uh, the real heroes, the real human right heroes who migrate every day uh, and contribute to the culture. Um, these young poets took notice of it, uh, SF Writers Corps project. Uh, so these young poets at uh, Sanchez Elementary put together this beautiful book called Street Heart and it's love poems to the mission murals. There's a SF Chronicle article about it and I'll make sure that if you want to, uh, Patty can make available to you. Okay, there's me. Um, here's another one of my works. Uh, 
we think that uh, we're being expressed that art uh, tra uh, migrating is a crime. And if migrating is a crime, then there's a machine behind that crime. And this is called the transgression machine. This is, my, this is the machinery that makes people migrate in my mind. So this is the blueprint for that machine. I can go into it in detail, but we wouldn't leave today. Um, here's just a, a painting of mine that just shows you the expression of painting. I just really love the craft of making art, and I love paint. Oh, here's Morning and Scars. So sad. So, so sad. Okay. Um, again, poets and writers are some of my favorite people. So I, um, I find ways to collaborate with them. One of my latest projects was called Gentromancer in 2016, and I asked several poets to write poetry to uh, gentrification as if it were a monster, as if it were personified uh, as a monster. So um, we basically wrote poems and saying, you can't have this, this is ours. So I think um, I really wanted to get to the idea of, you know, uh, Artists now are being, uh, Central Americans now in the mission are being, you know, twice displaced. First was the war. I would say three times displaced. First was the erasure of our history, things like 1932 and the massacre then we didn't, we don't know about. What about that? Uh, then, um, you know, the migration and, and, and having to be displaced then, right, to this new place. And then having to, having built a beautiful nest, a place with color, a place that we love, like the Mission District, now we have to face gentrification. So what do we do with that? Uh, it made, it, it, we, I showed at Acción Latina, which um, puts out El Tecolote, and I brought several copies for people to take. It actually, we published it today. It's hot off the press. And I did this piece of a young man named Alex Nieto, and uh, I'll tell you more about this piece a little bit further. Here's another uh, installation pe uh, photograph of Gentromancer. And I wanted to comment on the fires, all these fires that are coming about uh, when they were burning spaces in the mission accidentally and, um, you know, essentially endorsing violence against people to move. And uh, I said, wait a second, why are we afraid? You know, it was a very scary time, all the smoke in the mission. I remember a couple summers ago, all the smoke. And I said, hey, we got our own fire. We come from volcano land, right? We better watch out. We have our own fire. So this is my symbolic re re response to that. Here's some more installation shots. I'm going to push forward because I want to, um, I want to get to uh, what I'm doing now. Oh, here's some very cool people, Dr. Loco and the Martinez sisters, uh, some of the Acción Latina families and the, the Nieto family there. Um, the Nieto family asked me if they could use this image, in, in, uh, and I said, yes, absolutely. And so this image is now... Um, been kind of the, uh, the icon of the movement for the Alex Nieto Memorial, which uh, is something that I'm helping design. And it's going to look a little bit like this. I'm going to kind of breeze through this, but it has to do with the four directions and Alex Nieto's spirit being with us. Do we have time for one quick video? Actually, no? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that out. No, it's two minutes long, but we don't have to. I'm going to tell you a little bit just about, okay, yeah? The video? Okay, I'll show the video. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do at Acción Latina, but actually I'm going to save the video for last. Ah. At Acción Latina, um, which I am now the executive director of, uh, it is, our mission is to promote cultural arts, community media, and civic engagement as a way of building healthy and empowered Latino communities. I'm supposed to know that by heart because I'm the executive director, but I read it right from there. Um, but we do three things. We have a space, which is beautiful. Uh, we put together art shows that document uh, our masters, so um, the makers and the, the founders of this movement, uh, as well as uh, some of the young up-and-comers. We, El Tecolote, is, is a, a, our flagship media project, and talk about history. It's been around for 48 years this summer, and we have an archive that goes back that deep. So um, we put out El Tecolote. We have the very great fortune of uh, giving artists like Rupert Garcia and Juan Felipe Herrera, Juan Alicia, their first ink. Uh, there's Juan, Juan Gonzalez, the, the, the founder. So here's El Tecolote through the years. That's us now. And we've given a lot of journalists their start. So Santi, who you see there holding a camera, talking to another photographer, is now, uh, he just had a show at MCCLA 
of his solo photography, and he's one of the prime photographers for the Chronicle. So people that work for Tecolote have gone on to work for spaces like the Tribeca Film Festival, uh, 30 Rock in, in New York, NBC, um, the, New York, the New York Times, um, the SF Chronicle, certainly. Uh, and we're a, very, we're a safe space for community. So people come and enjoy the space with us. And we're part of the Latino Cultural District, which is Calle 24, and uh, some of which uh, the representatives are actually here. Um, we do a art stroll called um, Paseo Artístico, where we activate the Latino Cultural District with artists. We hire them, they come, they do workshops, uh, performances, and dance, and uh, film screenings, uh, stand-up comedy, pop-up murals, uh, and 50% of the programming is kid-friendly. Here we have uh, some evidence of an Afro, the Afro-Latino uh, encuentro that happened recently. Rafael Jesus uh, Gonzalez, the poet laureate of Berkeley. So we're very active in, in continuing to have artists uh, show in this space and talk about their work in this space. Okay. Um, oh, so this was last year's Roque Dalton event this time. Oh, we'll skip the video, but I'll just give one quick shameless plug. This is last year's Roque Dalton tribute event. This, this yesterday was Roque Dalton's birthday. Was it the 12th or the 16th? This week was Roque Dalton's birthday, and we celebrate, we celebrate it um, every year at Acción Latina by reading his poetry and reading his works and hanging out and having drinks and pupusas. So if you can come by tomorrow, 24th in Alabama, free pupusas. Um, drinks for a donation, and we'll be reading his work, so come join us. Leticia Hernandez will be there. So it'll be a party. I'm done.